Hi, my name is Abby and I am second. I am Marcus and I am second. Hi, I'm Mason and I'm second. I'm Luke and I'm second. I'm Colin and I'm second. I'm Ellie and I'm second. I'm Evan and I'm second. Hi, my name is Mercedes and I am second. Hi, my name is David and I am second. I am Olivia and I am second. My name is Sean and I am second. My name is Titus and I am second. I am Conigo and I am second. I am Jackson and I am second. I am Keely and I am second. Hi, my name is Lexi and I am second. Hi, I'm Wyatt and I'm second. Today, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to start out by having you fill in a blank. If you would grab your outlines, um, and I want you to fill this in. I'm not going to fill this one in for you. We just got done singing these beautiful songs about all the great things God has done for us and in us and through us. And that's really just a, to pave the way. You fill in the blank. God, your love is better than. Now, here's the only rule. You cannot use the word anything. And you cannot use the word everything. Those are very, very true statements. But it's not personal enough. I want it to be personal. God, your love is better than what? Maybe it's better than a hurt. Maybe it's better than a grudge you've been carrying, carrying around. Maybe it's better than a lie that you've been living. Maybe it's better than an addiction that you have. And, and I'm not just talking about like drugs and alcohol. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's an idol. You finish the line, God, your love is better than, and it doesn't have to be just one thing. I mean, you can just fill that thing up. God, your love is better than, go. Okay, do you guys have yours over here? You guys got yours over here? Awesome. Over here? Cool. Got it over here? You're like, yeah, I didn't even get out the paper. We're good. No, just kidding, man. Just kidding. Just kidding. Hey, hopefully you filled it out, man. I want you to be able to look at it. I mean, just look at what you wrote down. Like, hey, listen, this is an act of worship. God, you're acknowledging God, your love is better than whatever it was I was carrying around. God, your love is better than that. Man, and that's worth, that's like, man, that's, that's worth praising him. Like when he's first and we're second, it's easy to see, God, your love is better than my idol. God, your love is better than my hurt. God, your love is better than my habit. It's just easy to see. Well, this morning we're going to talk about that and we're going to talk about why God's love is better than. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 40, verse 2. And if your Bible's on your smartphone or tablet, that's great. Um, I brought my Bible. It's camouflage. You can't see it. Here's the sad part is I actually thought that was funny. That's, what's, that's the sad part. Okay, you guys can tease me and it's awesome. Psalm 40, verse 2. This is why God's love is better than. It's because he lifted me up out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. And what did he do? He set my feet on solid ground, and he steadied me as I walked along. Man, God's love really is better than anything that we just put in that blank. Why? Because I bet if we're honest, I bet if we were really honest, even if we didn't write, whatever God's love is better than that you would put in that blank is probably a little bit slimy. It's probably a little bit muddy is probably something that you were sinking in and it's not pretty and it's not fun. Why is God's love better than? Because when he's first and we're second, what does he do? He lifts us up out of that. And he sets our feet on solid ground. If you have ever had to walk in mud before and you hear like that weird like suction noise when your boot gets caught in the mud, it's hard to walk in that, right? And a lot of us, man, we walk around in that stuff. But see, Jesus came to lift us up out of that. And he gives us, puts us on solid ground. And he steadies us as we walk along. But not only does he do that. Look at what verse 3 says. It says that he's given me a new song to sing. Hallelujah. 
He's given me a new song. Not like, not like the despair song anymore. He's given me a new song, a new song of hope. One that's going to praise our God. And here's a beautiful thing. Like many will see what he's done in us and they'll be amazed. And then look at this. They will put their trust in the Lord because if God can do that for us, he can do that for anybody. This morning, we're going to look at a few stories. And all these things, all these stories have in common, at least I'm hoping, is that God lifted them up out of the mud and the mire, out of the pit of despair. And he put, them on, he put their feet on solid ground. And he gave them a new song to sing. And when people saw their lives, they were absolutely amazed. And people began to put their trust in Jesus because of what Jesus had done in these people's lives when he was first and they were second. So your Bibles are already open. I would ask that you would turn over to John chapter 4 with me. If you've grown up in church, you've probably heard this story before. Uh, and just remember, this is not just some bedtime story. This is a historical event. These are real people. This is real time. This happened. John chapter 4. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was, uh, verse 1, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. The Pharisees had a hard time with John the Baptist, but they're griping about everything and anything. They're like, oh, man, how dare Jesus have more people than John? Hey, John, can you believe this? Hey, they're broken just like us. Although, in fact, it wasn't Jesus who was baptizing, but it was his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea, and he went back once more to Galilee. Now, I like these things. If you've ever wondered why, why maps are in the back of your Bible, well, it's so that you can actually see where Jesus was and where he was heading and things like that. And so here up on the screen, I believe we've got a map. Awesome. Just a simple map. And if you're colorblind, I'm so sorry. This could be a little bit difficult. But here's Judea. This is the area that Jesus is starting in. And he's going to go up here to Galilee. The distance here is 85 miles. Samaria is going to be right in the middle of that deal which is where this event is going to take place. But if you remember, where was Jesus' hometown ministry as an adult? It was in Capernaum. Jesus is kind of heading back to the home base of ministry. He's on his way, but he's not done ministering yet as he travels the countryside. And so, man, you just need to know that Samaria, it's mountainous, it's rocky, it's arid, it's dry, it's hot. They've been hiking for a while. And let's see what happens. Verse 4. Now, Jesus had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of the ground of Jacob that he given to his son Joseph. We remember these men. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired as he was from the journey. He sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour of the day. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy some food. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and flocks and herds? Jesus answered her, everybody who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks this water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will, be, will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw this water. He told her, Hey, why don't you go call your husband and come back? I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you, when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped you on the mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are, kind, they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. 
God is spirit, and the worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called the Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. If you fast forward, uh, she leaves the bottle of water, or leaves the jug of water, and she goes, verse 29, come see the man who told me everything I had ever done. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him, verse 39. And many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Now, if you just look at this woman's life for a minute, she's obviously by the well by herself. Hmm, that should tell us something. Typically, man, that would, you would, that would be a community-type event where the women would gather. But this woman's not like the rest of the ladies in town because why? She's been f- married five times. Ladies, if you're happily married, you probably would not want her around your husband because of her reputation. Ladies, if you have a boyfriend, you probably wouldn't want her around your boyfriend because of her reputation. This lady, she knows what it is to be alone. We don't even know her name. We just know her as the Samaritan woman. She knows what it is to be alone. But you'll also see in here, and we'll talk about this in depth a little bit later, Jesus' response to her. And Jesus' interaction with her is so life-giving, it is so life-transforming that she leaves changed. That in the course of that interaction, Jesus lifts her up out of the mud and the mire that she'd been living in. He puts a new song in her heart, and she leaves that experienced that encounter completely different than when she entered it. For, because how do we know that? Because she went back into town. And she started going and telling people everything that Jesus had said about her. And she's like, I think this is the Messiah. And they could see the difference in her life. Man, what was that verse? Psalm 42 and 40 verse 2, verse 3. He lifted me up out of the mud and the mire. He put me on solid ground and he gave me a new song to sing. And many will be amazed and believe. Well, the Samaritans started believing. Well, today, when we look at our I Am Second video, we're going to see somebody that has something in common with this woman. She was living a life, and she found herself in the mud and the mire. And one day, God comes calling. Actually, he'd been calling for a long time. She finally just listened. And look at the difference that happened in her life. Check it out. All right, so we heard you have a little business. Um, So can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Um, well, I'm currently the president at In-N-Out Burger, which was a little mom and pop burger stand that started in 1948 and, um, grew to be pretty big. (laughs) It's been a part of my life since I was born, I guess, being close with different people that work there and. You know, it really got introduced into my life when my dad died. Both my parents were very loving. I remember being pretty cheerful, little girl that was a little bit spoiled because my siblings were 12 and 16 years older than me. My dad was uh, really funny. He was a little bit eccentric loved to make people laugh, loved to laugh himself. He used to explain songs to me. We had this connection with with music, we love music. He spoke to me like I was an adult when I was four years old. Somehow he had wisdom and discernment that, you know, I was gonna be exposed to so many different things in life and I was gonna need that straightforwardness and that honesty. Probably around age five or six, I noticed uh, we were going to visit my dad in the hospital. And I thought it was just the hospital he was staying at, but it turned out to be a rehab. My mom explained it just that he was sick. It wasn't until I was older that I realized he had a drug addiction from different surgeries he'd had and a lot of pain in his past. Pain that he didn't know what to do with It was really hard for me to see him fail and to be weak because I knew how bad he wanted to be a good husband and a good father. 
it's a matter of time before the drugs and uh, another woman and then that was pretty much it. I got divorced when I was 12 and that's when I really started longing for that attention and that love because my dad was the greatest source of that. One day I was on my way to school and he had called in the morning and I talked to him and I was rushing him off the phone because I had to go to school. And that was the last time I talked to him. My world shattered. After my dad died, there was no way I was going to be alone. He's gone, so I had even greater reason to fill the void. I got married when I was 18. I'd graduated a couple months before that. You know, it, it wasn't right. I knew that that small, still voice had told me, don't do this, and I did it. And I, I paid the price with a divorce. And jumped right into uh, the arms of someone else. At that point, I pretty much realized I'm the outcast in the family. Now I'm divorced and I figured, you know, I might as well just, <laughs> might as well just embrace this. Started smoking pot, drinking, which were things that I really had wanted to stay away from after watching my dad. I realized that I'm gonna follow in the footsteps of my father and that I'm gonna meet an early death if I do not get right with God and, and follow him because the enemy just wanted to wipe me out. I could let go of the pot and the alcohol, but letting go of the guy was something different because being alone, I just, I didn't, I didn't want to be alone. I just was praying and asking for God to give me the strength to do what was right. I knew that I couldn't go back home that night and sleep with my boyfriend. I had to tell him, hey, this isn't happening. You know, if you're going to be doing any of those things, don't do them around me. He ended up uh, getting saved. So then I'm like, okay, now I can get married. It was the fast track. We got married in November. Was it really the right thing? I can't say no because I have two precious children from that marriage, but um, six years later, another divorce, um, another affair. I couldn't feel like a bigger failure at that point. I just couldn't recover who I was. So alone, didn't last long. I ended up in another relationship. We ended up having a child together. We got married and uh, I married him because I didn't want to be alone and I felt like, okay, this will be right. He married me because of money. I was cheated on off and on for three and a half years. First time I found out he cheated on me, I'm like, well, you know, I deserve it. <laughs> I'm paying for it. He cheated on me while I was pregnant, disrespected. Never had I been talked to the way he talked to me. Treated like trash. It was the worst time of my life. You can see where someone that just wants that love and appreciation was getting further and further away from, from what she wanted. I was trying to believe the lies that I deserve that and God's punishing me. The things that can be said can cut you very, very deeply and can change who you believe you think you are. I just continued to put up with it. No way could I get divorced again. I mean, how old am I? And I've been divorced a handful of times, really. It was terrible. And it really, it really pushed me. God took me to a place that I'd never been before. And he showed me that in that time where I felt more alone than ever, more of a piece of trash than ever, more of a failure, that he was there and he was ready to love me. 
and fill that void. And he'd been there all along wanting that, but he just needed me to let go of that tangible person. It was my dad first, then it was the next guy. The next guy, I was never willing to just let go to see that God had something better. I was forced to at this time because this was something I couldn't change. This was someone that was throwing me to the curb. I was divorced again and uh, knew it was time to take time away. That time alone was some of my greatest memories with God. It was an alone that was okay because I wasn't completely alone. I had the Jesus that walked on water, healed the sick. I had that Jesus filling that void, touching my heart, pouring into who I'm called to be and who he sees me as rather than who I believed I was because of the things I'd done. I really valued the love and good times I had with my dad, but even that can't compare completely to the love that God has for me. It's like, you know, you, you're a little kid riding your bike for the first time, your dad's proud and he's cheering you on, and it's like he helped me learn how to ride that bike, and, and God got me back up after all of these failures, and he can lift me up and see me go forward, and I know that he can be glorified. And <laughs> riding a bike and a proud dad versus creator of the universe being able to use you is like... <laughs> My name is Lindsay Snyder, and I am second. Pretty uh, powerful story. And I just want to sit in that for a minute, but I also got to tell you, she's got a pretty cool job, doesn't she? In and Out Burger. And if you've ever been to In and Out Burger and you've never noticed this, next time, lift up the cup. And when you lift up the cup, on the bottom lip of the company that she leads, you will see a significant truth because you'll see John 3.16 on the cup of pop that you're holding. Let's all go to in and out Burger. Let's just go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call Glenn. Say, Glenn, get the airport ready. The church, we're going in and out. That's what we're doing. Now, I want to take us back to John chapter 4, where Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at the well. And she's been married five times, and the guy that she's been li living with currently isn't her husband. When you saw Lindsay's story, you saw that woman's story. And when you saw that woman's story, you saw Lindsay's story. There's some real pain involved there. And just trying to make one decision after another, hoping that the next one is right, hoping that the next one's going to be better. But what you see is, when we come to the end of ourselves and we see Jesus for who he is, we see that he's always been there to lift us up out of the pit of despair, out of that pit, that slimy, the mud and the mire, and set our feet on solid ground. And he puts a new song in our heart that people can see the difference and they're amazed like when people read, John gave 42 verses to that passage for a reason. Because people would be amazed. Because you know what? That woman, the Samaritan woman, Lindsay, they're not the only people using relationships to fill a void only God can fill. He wanted people to see the redeeming, loving power of Jesus Christ. That he puts a new song in our heart. People will be amazed. And what will they do? They'll give their life to Jesus. I think that both of those ladies would say... Jesus lifted me out of the mud of the mire, put a new song in his heart, and I think they would all say, God's love is better than any love I've ever experienced. Because his love so thoroughly transformed me. 
What I would say is God's love is better than anything we deserve, isn't it? Man, that he would take us out of our own filth and that he would not run from us but embrace us. And that's what I want us to see just so clearly, whether it's in Lindsay's life, whether it's in the Samaritan woman's life, or whether it's your life. Look at how Jesus interacts with us when he finds us at our worst. He's not there condemning us. He's not there saying, you idiot, you've done that five times. Do you think a six one's going to make it better? He's not there saying, you idiot, that hobby's not going to do it. He doesn't condemn us. He's not antagonistic towards us. He's not inflammatory towards us. How does Jesus meet us when we're at our lowest, when we're at our worst? He's gentle. He's patient. He's welcoming. And he's loving. Now, I know a whole lot of people think, man, if I walked into a church, maybe you're that person today. I'm afraid the building's going to fall down. Maybe you know somebody who feels that way. But anybody who has ever encountered Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and is open to him, understands he's not there to condemn. He's not there to be antagonistic. He's there to lift us up out of the mud and the mire and put a new song in our heart, one that glorifies God. And many will see the difference and many people will believe. See, we're not just checking boxes here. We're not just wasting an hour today. Man, we're talking about real power of love that it wants to transform your life today, wants to do a work in your life today. You see, The invitation of Jesus, the gentleness of Jesus invites us to step out of our sin and into God's love. I would also tell you that God's hand is ready this morning to help us up. If we'll extend our hand out to him, he'll pull us out of that. He'll pull pull us out of the mud and the mire and he'll set our feet on firm ground. He'll put a new song in our heart and many will be amazed and they'll put their trust in God. When Christ is first and we are second, that's what he does. He pulls us up out of and we'll all stand and testify that his love is better than we deserve or anything else we could ever possibly experience. So let's live that life. Let's lead with that life so that people will see the mystery and the beauty of Jesus Christ who lives inside of you. And today, if you don't have that relationship, all it means, all that's required of you is to commit your life to following him. Just call on the name of Jesus and you'll be saved and you can do that right in your seat. We won't make you stand up or do anything that you might think is embarrassing. You just give your life to Jesus in that seat, but we would love to know about it. If you meet us back at the place, just tell us your story. Because guess what? Isn't that refreshing? You know one of the things I've loved about this whole I Am Second series? Is nobody's trying to hide who they were before Jesus. Nobody's trying to hide what Jesus did for them. In fact, they're celebrating what Christ has done. And all of them are saying, I'm better off with Jesus. That's true for each and every one of us, whether we're willing to admit it or not, we're all better off with Jesus. Not only now, but forevermore. Lord God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for a chance to open up your word. Thank you for placing people in our lives, Lord, who would share how you pulled them out of the mud and the mire. Lord, I pray that you would do the same with us as we interact with our family members, our neighbors, our coworkers, or in our community this week. And God, when the enemy tries to rear his ugly head to silence us, I pray you help us see that so clearly and be bold and continue to go forward. We love you, God. I pray that it would be true that you are first and we are second. In Jesus' name, amen.